advertising. You get reputation. What other things can you get? services like human resources and training. Okay. So then, uh, after contractual agreement, you had strategic alliance. So what's a kind of strategic alliance can we make? Joint what's a joint venture? What is a joint venture? What kind of alliance? Yeah. So we have two firms, A and B, and they make a new firm, AB. Okay? Maybe we can use both the names. Different firm. <coughs> What's the last one? Direct investment. Direct investment. Just go by ourselves. Okay, so that's where we finished. We were talking about in the last class. So, we talked about we can do the brownfield investment or greenfield investment. Okay, acquisition is brownfield. We already the field is already prepared. We fail, we go by ourselves. Okay. Uh, we have these factors which can influence the structure and performance of the direct investments. The timing, uh, the complexity of contracts. So if it's too cost too much to make the contract with the other company, like the license or the joint venture is very complicated, then we're not going to do that. We just do it by ourselves. Transaction cost is similar. Transaction cost means we have to spend a lot of time and money to make a contract. We have to pay the lawyers, we have to pay the accountants. Okay? Uh, we have to, to go to a lot of meetings. Then we might decide to do direct investment. Technology transfer. We don't want to give the other company our technology. Okay. If I pick a company in Brazil and I give them the license for my product, then I do, do I trust them? Are they going to sell my technology to somebody else? Will they give my technology to somebody else? Or are they going to keep it secret? Okay? Can I trust them to make the license or not? Do you understand that point? I, if I give them the license, it means I give them all my secrets. They have all my secrets, all my technology. Okay? So the point is they should, have get, they should try to protect my secrets, but maybe they won't. Maybe they won't protect my secrets. Maybe they'll sell to somebody else. So if I want to, if I'm worried about the transfer of technology, I might do direct foreign investment. Okay. Uh, product differentiation. So I want to have more control over the product myself, direct foreign investment. Uh, if we have good experience, do we have experience of that society before? Can, do we think that the other, if we acquire a firm, we could have a lot of cultural problems, okay, or not? So if we think no, no, not much cultural problems, then we can acquire the firm, direct investment, okay? Advertising and reputation barrier. So maybe. We don't want to go there ourselves because we have some problem. Our company is not known, or we don't have, we're not able to do the marketing. So we have to think about all of these things. So we're going to look at a couple of case studies. Let's look at Zara first of all. So Zara has their own direct investment, company-owned stores. They have joint ventures and they have franchises. So they have three different ways for three different types of markets. So their foreign direct investment is in the key. Key means important. We put the key in the door, so key is important. Key is just a short way of writing important. If you're writing, you could also use key instead of important. It's just three letters, right? So key, high profile countries with high growth prospect and low economic and political risk. Then they're going to do direct investment. So if we look back here, when we're choosing about direct foreign investment, 
if we think about this low economic and political risk, then we're not going to have much problems here. Okay? Uh, it's a key high profile country, so we want to control our product. Okay? Do you understand? Because it's very important, we want more control. So we want direct foreign investment. If we just use the other way, we don't have complete control over the product. So for example, France is next to Zara, Spain, Zara is in Spain. So France is an important market for Zara. So they want to control that themselves. They want control. Okay? They're not worried about the risk in France. France is a very stable country. Okay? So it makes sense to uh, have our own store there. Okay? The thing about FDI is it takes up many resources, especially management time. So they have to spend a lot of money and spend a lot of time. But this is Zara mostly used, their own uh, direct investment. They buy the store, okay, or lease the store themselves and run the store themselves. In 18 countries, they have 231 stores. So this is their biggest one. Okay, so main countries like US, France. Okay, Italy, they have a lot of stores. Zara uses franchising in countries that are small, risky, or have large cultural differences or administrative barriers. For example, the Middle East. <coughs> it used to be the case in China, but nowadays it's the case in the Middle East, many countries. You're not allowed to have the direct investment. Okay? It's not possible for the foreigners to own their own store. So, so they can't. Okay? That's a large administrative barrier. They're not allowed to own their own store in the Middle East. Okay? Iceland is just a small country. How many people live in Iceland? <coughs> no, that's Ireland. Iceland, less than one million. Slightly less than one million. Okay? Maybe half a million. So it's not that big. So they don't they're not going, they don't want to spend a lot of time, management time and resources. So they just use franchising for Iceland. Okay? Uh, the Middle East is even if we were allowed to own a store there, there is large cultural and legal differences in the Middle East. So how does the franchising work? So first of all, the franchiser is selling Zara's products, right? So Zara doesn't pay the lease or doesn't buy the, st the store. The franchiser owns the store and owns the lease. Okay? But they're going to buy Zara products. They're going to sell Zara products. So Zara gets, first of all, the person is selling their product. So they get advantage. Second of all, 5 to 10% of sales, they need to pay the fee to Zara of every sale. Okay? What does Zara give them in return? Obviously the reputation and the marketing of Zara. Okay? But also they offer human resources, they offer training for the staff, like customer service training. Okay? They offer IT system. Okay? You understand IT system? That kind of thing. Okay? Logistics. And returns means the store, if they don't sell the product, they can return some of the products. Just 10% of the product they can return to Zara. So they, have, they use franchising in 12 countries with 31 stores. Then Zara uses joint ventures, okay, strategic alliance. They use that in the key markets with barriers to direct entry. Okay? Usually prime retail space being the main barrier. Do you understand prime retail space? Prime means most important retail area. Zara doesn't want to be selling its goods in, uh, I don't know, in uh, Ichon, right? They want to be in the center of Seoul. Where is the prime retail space in the center of Seoul? Yongdong? Is that for the high label brand? Hmm? Girls? Maybe the guys don't know? <laughs> They're just guessing. Girls, where is the high <laughs> retail space in Korea? Where is seen as the best? Street in Korea. We have Fifth Avenue in New York. Hmm? You're not sure? <laughs> huh? 
Where do you go to buy the best fashion in Korea? Is there a store in Korea? Or area? The city? Mm, I'm asking girls. <laughs> girls. Mm? Never, you don't go sh not interested in shopping? Hmm? Harrow Street. Where is that? Where is that? Harrow hmm? Street. Where is that? Up you down. So up you down. So then Zara wants to get some space on up you down, but they can't. Why? Because somebody already owns all of the stores, okay? And they won't allow Zara to go there. Okay, so what does Zara do in that case? They make a joint venture. So they made a joint venture with the mall owner in Germany. So large, they own a lot of malls in important location in Germany. So Zara made the agreement, right? You allow me to be some flagship store, a very important store in your malls. You understand malls? Do you like going to the mall? The weekend? In the US, people like going to the mall, even if they don't buy something. So they made a joint venture with the mall owner in Germany. Zara owns 50%, the, store of the mall owner in Germany owns 50%. Okay? Do you understand the reason? If Zara doesn't make the joint venture, they can't get the good location for their shop. Okay? Instead of being in, in Apujang, Zara is going to be in Guri City. Okay, or some other place, not good location, okay, for the customers. So similar in Japan. In Japan, they have the barrier to entry is distribution again. So they made a joint venture with a distributor in Japan, and then they were able to set up their store in Japan. So, do you understand the strategy of Zara? Different market entry in different situation. Okay, uh, so joint ventures is, is the lowest one, right? They only have a few joint ventures. So then let's discuss these questions with our partner. Give three benefits of global marketing. Why would a marketer exclude a country after phase one or phase two of the marketing plan? And what kind of situations is a joint venture or licensing? Suitable, like Zara use licensing and joint venture. In what kind of situation? Thank you. 
제외하다. 제외하는 거 나라를. 포스? 네, 포스트 뭐. Take off your mask just for a second to answer the question. Don't know. Hey, email. 
Your Honor. Yes. Okay. So there's too much political or economic risk. Anything else? Or the, if they are market leader, or mm, the competition. We look here at competition. Why? Competition. Anything else? <coughs> Cost is too high. Okay. Or we have to spend a lot of money to adapt the product. Right? And it's not worth it. It costs too much to make all the adaptations. So, then the next, uh, the last question. Uh, Kim Yuna. Yes. In what kind of situations is a joint venture or licensing suitable? <coughs> we looked at the example of Zara. Why did they use licensing and why did they use joint ventures? Why would we need a partner? That's the question. In what case do we need a partner to enter the country or enter the market? Why did Zara need a partner? Usually Zara doesn't want to have a partner, they just want to do direct investment. Why did they need a partner in some countries? Because they have risk. Mm, the Germany and Japan, where Zara entered, didn't have much risk, right? We could use joint venture where we have risk, yes, shared risk. But in Zara's case, Germany and Japan didn't have any risk, but they still used a joint venture. Why? They wanted to get the best retail space. Okay, so there was some barrier to entry. There may be some barrier. Do you understand barrier to entry? Something that's stopping us. We discussed about it earlier in the course barrier to entry. Okay, so we need to get around the barrier to entry. We can make a joint venture. So let's check on the internet. So just visit. Or look at for the Google about for the next day, look at their home pages. Look at their involvement and strategies towards international markets. So we talk about Zara, right? So what do you think uh, Ford and Nestle strategy is? Do you think they're doing acquisitions? Are they doing uh, joint ventures? Are they doing franchising? Do they have a global product just for all the mark, all the world? Or do they have specific changed product for different countries? Okay, customized products for different countries. So like how many brands do they have? Are the brands being sold differently in different countries? So do you understand the task? Okay. For example, you can even check in Korea, Ford in Korea and Nestle in Korea. 
Okay, how are they selling in Korea? So you can check in Kazakhstan, you can check in South Africa, you guys can check in China, right? What is the strategy of Ford in China or Nestle in China? So how did Ford or Nestle enter the market in China? How did they enter the market in South Africa? Did they acquire a South African company or are they selling their global brands? Exact answer searching on Google. Nestle Korea acquisitions, right? <coughs> okay, so here we can see they have some information, their home page. <coughs> so they're talking about latte here and chocolate. Okay, so we can check. If you want to know about the market entry, we can Google Nestle Korea market entry. <coughs> you can see some <coughs> Korean law blog explains Nestle entered in the 80s, quite struggling in Korea. Pick of Korean tastes, okay? Korean consumers have very different tastes. Okay. So we, we don't have to, we can just use the Googling, right? And also looking at the website. So let's take five minutes to do that.
First of all here, checking is Ford using a global strategy or a local strategy, right? Is Nestle using a global strategy or a local strategy more? Okay, then market entry. How did Ford enter Korea? How did Nestle enter Korea? Okay, what market entry are they using? Are they using acquisitions, direct investment, exporting, okay? What are they doing to enter the market? Indeed, we'll get an idea when we look at the four different countries. Should already have found this, so just we're looking at market entry. What market entry does Ford use in Korea, right? And what market entry does Nestle use?
right then, so let's discuss the first part one. Uh, is Ford more global or more local strategy? Global strategy. So it's selling more or less the same product to different countries. Same type of marketing. Same brand. Can you buy the same Ford brand car in Korea as in the US? <coughs> yes. What about Nestle? <coughs> SA is a more global or local strategy? More based on the local. Do you know this brand? Aero? Hmm? No, they don't sell in Korea, right? You know, maybe they sell in the UK and South Africa. Okay, it's a brand of chocolate. So if we look through the Nestle brand, brands, there might be a lot of brands you don't know for all of the different things. Why? Because they have different brands in different countries, different products. Product is different. Do you know this? Did they sell in Korea? No. Right? They have a lot of different products, even the ice cream, right? Do you know this ice cream? No. Okay, so this one is maybe sold in, in, in the US, but in Korea, Korean people have different tastes, so they sell a different brand. Ford is selling this type of car over the world, okay? Then what about the market entry strategy? Let's start with Ford. What kind of market entry does Ford use? Korea. <coughs> what about in, in China? How is Ford entering the market in China? Chinese students, did you find out? Does Ford have a manufacturing plant in China? Yes, joint ventures. Joint ventures. Joint ventures. Is it manufacturing in China? Yes. Yes, so it has joint venture in China. With who, who do you know? Who like Hyundai, right? Who is the joint venture with? Do you know? Beijing. Another Beijing company, right? Uh, in Korea. Does Ford manufacture in Korea? No. no. So how does it enter Korea? Exporting. Probably, I guess, it's a contractual agreement, like licensing, right? So what usually happens in the car industry is Ford will sell the license to a Korean company to the permission to sell Ford cars in Korea. Okay. So then that person pays, they have an option, and that person pays for the highest fee, then they have the permission to sell the Ford brand name in Korea, okay? Then they will perhaps set up dealers, dealerships to sell the Ford cars, that kind of thing, okay? What if, so it's probably similar, did you guys find out about Ford in South Africa and Kazakhstan? How are they doing the market entry there? Uh, I think 